All right, if I could go ahead and get everyone to take your seats, we'll start. And obviously, those of you in the back, you're welcome to come up here by the front by the microphone. All right, hey, good afternoon. Hopefully, we'll have a few more people filter in here in the room. But I want to welcome everyone that's here to our eighth and final presentation for academic year 2022 of the Interagency Brown Bag Lecture Series. For those of you I don't know, my name is Rod Cox. I'm with the Command and General Staff College Foundation. And on behalf of my partner, the Command and General Staff School, Colonel Cardoni and Mr. Nichols, it's our pleasure to present this lecture series to enhance your interagency awareness and education. The lecture series is made possible by grants from the Pro Foundation and First Command Financial Services. My thanks to General George Harris, who's here with us, and Colonel Matt Anderson and her team here at Leavenworth. We appreciate your all support. I will mention, though, if anybody's got any questions or concerns about financial planning or thinking about that, please see one of those gentlemen. They'll be happy to talk to you. And once again, we thank you for the support. I will also administratively want to let you know that this broadcast, this presentation is being broadcast over the, the college's Blackboard system through our outstation, so I welcome those people that are watching out there, as well as it'll be recorded and then posted up for our interagency practitioners around the world at my website and on our t YouTube site. What that means for you, though, here in the classroom or on an outstation, if you do have a question, please move forward to one of the microphone sets. You don't need to touch any buttons. The technician will control that. But just speak into the microphone so that it can be picked up on recording and all others can hear your questions or conversations with the presenter. I will say that today's presentation um, is something that is probably w not well known amongst most of the uniform personnel, but is a critically important piece of information. And so this session, I believe, will be educational. Learn about an organization that most of us don't know exists. It's an organization that serves kind of as a chamber of commerce for federal agencies, and it provides synergistic services that many agencies find very useful. There are federal executive boards across the country working in major metropolitan areas doing all kinds of things that enhance agencies, federal employees, and their communities. But you may be thinking, particularly if you're a uniformed service member, I deal in national security issues. How or why would I care about a federal executive board and why would that be of interest to me? Today's presentation will answer those questions. I will tell you that the role that the FEB plays in interagency cooperation and coordination at the local level is unmatched. I'll offer you three takeaways as I try to answer that question, but certainly you'll hear more from an expert about it. Three things that you should know from this. Your future CONUS jobs are going to put you in a position whereby your mission will require you to work with uh, other federal agencies that are in the locale or have to do with your mission set. Knowing that a federal executive board exists will be one avenue that you can use to help affect that coordination. Secondly, you'll find that through the federal executive board that their network can improve the community relations and the quality of life for your soldiers and their families at whatever installation you are at. And then lastly, as a taxpayer, it's good to know that there is an agency that exists that has the mission for cooperation and coordination across federal agencies that in fact does save us tax dollars. That's something good to know, and there's not too many government agencies that do that. It's my pleasure to introduce today's presenter. Mr. Larry Heisel has led the federal Kansas City Federal Executive Board since 2013. He took that position after serving as a senior program manager at the Office of Personnel Management. Mr. Heisel holds a BBA from Thomas Edison State University and is very active in community volunteers services. Please welcome Mr. the Executive Director of the KC Federal Executive Board, Mr. Larry Heisel. Thank you, Rod. Appreciate it. Wow, you, you actually gave a lot of my presentation away. So, uh, but the, thank you all so much for uh, allowing me to be here today and uh, talk to you a little bit about the FEB. And uh, you know, that is one of the things that I was going to bring up. Well, why, as a as a uniform personnel, why should I have knowledge of the FEB? What can they do for us? And that's one of the things that we're going to discuss today. That you're not always going to be in Leavenworth. You may not be in an area that the FEB covers. However, there are, these are services that are available to you, and there's, you know, there's some type of a, there's a, a plan in 
progress right now that actually there will be FBB coverage over an entire country is what I understand. So they're going to expand our areas that we cover. So what is the FEB program? Well, the FEB was established in 1961. The uh, Kennedy administration, and it started actually under the Eisenhower administration, started looking at how can we involve and engage the uh, other federal agencies that are outside the, the uh, uh, DC Beltway. 85% um, of the personnel, uh, federal personnel, actually exist out of the Washington, D.C. area. So it was, this was a, a route for them to be able to communicate with those other 85% of the employees out in the field and uh, get, engage them in, with uh, each other as far as their missions. Now we're overseen by the Office of Personnel Management. We're soon to actually be under a new uh, line of business under uh, Office of Management of Budget, GSA, and OPM. So again, a little bit of teaser next year if I come back and do that. This may be a completely different uh, presentation, but we'll, we'll talk about that then. Uh, we are located in 28 cities across the country, or largely in, uh, in regional hubs, such as Kansas City is, or large areas of the uh, federal population. And, you know, our, you know, our real involvement is to uh, create a forum for, for those local federal agencies and the lead personnel to work with each, each other. You can see up here kind of where we're, we're located and the personnel that's, uh, that's in that area. Right now we have about 38,000 federal employees right in the Kansas City metropolitan area. So why FEB? Well, here in Kansas City being a regional hub, we have 160 different federal agencies all reporting to DC, as you can kind of see here. So they all have their individual missions and rightly so but they don't, they don't communicate locally. So that's wh really where we come, come through is if we find out that EPA has something going on that the Corps of Engineers needs to be involved in or maybe FEMA or Health and Human Services, that's, that's how we engage with everyone. So our purpose, strength and coordination outside DC and bring those uh, uh, coordination and budgetary procedures and, and, and uh, special initiatives to creation. We have uh, three core functions. Intergovernment and inter interagency collaboration. That's kind of where, again, uh, we will work with uh, the local, per local um, um, chamber of commerce, area development councils, anything that is, that is done across uh, agency platforms, we're engaged in. Emergency preparedness and security and employee safety. We are the ones for the local uh, federal uh, population. We make the recommendations, for example, of you know, severe weather. Do we, do we telework that day? Do we, heaven forbid, close the offices? We don't, but uh, especially with telework. Um, but uh, that we, we have our own 3 a.m. club that gets up and, and uh, makes that decision. And then workforce development support, and that's probably where we're most engaged in. The board is made up the senior most official of a, each agency. So whenever there's a new commander that comes to the post here, he's he or she is automatically promoted to that FEB member. So uh, whoever the lead of, it, of uh, each federal uh, agency is going to, to be automatically FEB member. So the size part uh, participation or the agencies go from, uh, from just a, a single person here in Kansas City to well over um, you know, uh, thousands of employees. So we, we govern with a, with a uh, chair and then uh, two vice or three vice chairs underneath that, and then uh, uh, ten ten executive members. So we do represent civilian, military, postal, and law enforcement in all sizes of that. Kind of see the presence of the uh, of the government in Kansas City, uh, ten regional hubs. Uh, when you add in contract workforce members, we have over forty one thousand, and that within itself is that's the exceeds three three million dollars in in actual federal payrolls, that three billion dollars, excuse me, that's going into the local community. And when the when you look at the multiplying effect, it actually exceeds another 1.2 million dollars. Some unique things about uh, the uh, the uh, federal population here, federal agencies. Um, I like to call Kansas City the new Ellis Island because we are when someone is is wanting to become a citizen, 
their immigration papers or their application comes to the National Benefit Center, which is located here in Kansas City with, in the Lee Summit area and also another, another branch in, in Overland Park. We also have a, the uh, card processing center, which is that issues all the green or red cards for, uh, for, um, for immigration purposes. And then finally, once everything's done, it's the National Records Center. So they, they all that paperwork comes back to the National Records Center. We do have a, a large series of caves here in the Kansas City area that is perfect for storing records that, uh, again, we'll talk about that in a bit as well. Providing security to your nation, we all, all know how great Fort Leavenworth is and how, how lucky we have here. We also uh, cover uh, Whiteman Air Force Base, uh, Lake, Lake Cindy Army Ammunition Plant, we cover that, which is on the uh, east side of Independence that, that uh, produces all the small arms ammunition for uh, all U.S. Uh, uh, armed forces as well as NATO forces. And the National Nuclear Security Administration, which is in South Kansas City, and they, they actually um, do 85% of all nuclear weapons are created there and the, not with the, the, uh, the uh, uh, radiation, but so that's where they're created and then, then produced, uh, finished uh, elsewhere. Uh, Watch the Skies, the Olathe Air Traffic Control Center covers a 10 state area in the Midwest. And the National Aviation Severe Weather Center actually covers the entire Western Hemisphere. So any airline that uh, is going to fly in the Western Hemisphere they, they're, they're looking at the, the severe weather occurrences they may come across and, and providing that information to them. So that's right in North Kansas City. We're also the nation's checkbook. Um, the Bureau of Fiscal Service, which is located in headquartered here in Kansas City, is they, they do 99.9% .9 of all payments that the federal government makes. If, it's a, if we're doing, sending money to Ukraine, it comes from the National or the uh, Bureau of Fiscal Services. All Social Security checks, all pension checks, either either paper-wise or or electronic, goes through that that service. We also have a large Internal Revenue uh, Service campus that employs at uh, during the peak peak times over 8,000 uh, employees. Uh, that will be one of two campuses left by by 2025. So it was. It was a design they wanted to check out in Kansas City. Uh, they're creating one more, and then they're going to initially, they're going to eventually fold everything back in. I would like to say that Kansas City is also the nation's attic, but the Smithsonian already has that tagline, so I'm going to say that we're the storage pod. Uh, kind of going back to the National Records Center, we do store records for uh, uh, NARA as well as Social Security, the post office, IRS, any paper documents, now electronic documents are sent here to Kansas City in, the, in the, those limestone caves. Here's our structure. Obviously, uh, from president to OPM to the FEB chairperson. And then I work with them. We're a, a big staff of two, so we rely a lot on volunteers to get our, get our missions done. And then, as you see, we have three vice chairs that cover each of those, uh, those mission areas and several different uh, groupings that, that fall underneath that, and we'll, we'll go through those briefly. So I think our most important line of business is the emergency preparedness, security, and employee safety. Um, that allows us to, uh, you know, again, what that combines is we create an emergency dismissal plan for all federal agencies here in the Kansas City area. Uh, it, uh, it, it's, it simulates what the, the OPM dismissal plan is in D.C., but then we add in pertinent information for, for the Kansas City area. Uh, we were the first uh, city in the country to have a, a agreement with our local health department to set up closed po points of dis uh, dispensing. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with pods. Uh, this was actually something that's, that is uh, very relevant now because what it's, what it's designed to do is if there is an anthrax spray over Royal Stadium, tomorrow during the game. And instead of, uh, if we have employees there, we could set up an emergency pod just for our federal employees, where our employees would go through, show their PIV card, and get medication for themselves and their families, and it, even their neighbors if they want. Now, ideally, it would have been great if we could have done this with COVID. Uh, however, the states said, no, you, you have to be a registered nurse to give the injections on that. So 
our volunteers, we have over 400 volunteers trained to give medication, dispense medication, and have four sites set up in case we, we are able to open that up. Uh, but uh, again, we were the first to set it up in the country. It sounds a little bit self-serving. Well, the government's get, getting their stuff and taking care of their employees. Yes, we are. But what's that, what that's doing is it's taking 160,000 people off the responsibility of the health department. So they're thrilled, thrilled about it. And then we are part of a pilot program with the CDC that our volunteers the, then will go to the convention center or Airhead Stadium or such to dispense medication to the, the public as well. So again, it's something that benefits uh, all sides. Uh, we uh, also, we have an emergency notification system. If we do have a, a true emergency, we're able to notify our members uh, within, uh, within seconds of, uh, through either texts, emails, or, or phone calls. We set up a field, field federal safety health council. Uh, that is kind of the OSHA for the federal government. So basically OSHA kind of looks and protects the uh, employees out in the, in the corporate world. This is our, uh, our safety council, which uh, again, uh, it's been a, um, awarded uh, top, top council uh, twice in the last five years. And then we set up, a, we have a, a Kansas City Regional COOP working group. And I don't know, every, you know oh, hopefully all of you are familiar with COOP or continuity operations. What that is, is you know, every federal agency has a requirement that if they get blo blown down because of a tornado, they have to be able to stand up an office within that similar location within 24 hours. So that's where continuity operations is. Now, before 9-11, uh, everyone kind of had that, but they hadn't really practiced it. So they had they dusted that off, and then start, started to really engage it. And this this really falls back into um, what we do because what what happens is so we were the first city to also set up a regional interagency coop exercise. The importance of that is when they what they found in after 9/11 was it wasn't just FEMA coming in. We had to have FEMA. We had to have EPA to check the uh, check the uh, the environment. We had to have health and human services. We had to have counseling. We had to have the Corps of Engineers. How are we going to uh, get rid of this debris? So it's a multitude of federal agencies that have to come into play when when there's true disaster. So we'll do different exercises each year. This is just an uh, idea. All of us know about the uh, the uh, uh, New Madrid faults. That's the on the, uh, the uh, southeast corner of uh, Missouri. Uh, and Kansas City will be uh, one of the prime centers of, uh, of restructuring once that happens because that is expo expected to take out Memphis altogether uh, and do major damage in St. Louis and, and Chicago. So, uh, so we, again, in 2019, we, we practiced that exercise, had 200 federal employees participate in 22 different agencies see exactly what would we do. And they go through a, a, uh, a uh, basically a timeline of this is what's happening in scenarios and have to engage with e each other. And we talked a little bit about, uh, uh, we were, had the first national exercise of the last mile project. That's where the uh, points of dispensing um, is engaged in. So before I go to the next business line, uh, does anyone have any questions about the emergency preparedness business line. Am I going too fast or not fast enough? <laughs> okay. So uh, workforce development and support. And that's really, uh, as Rod said, you know, part of what the uh, federal executive boards do is we try to, to um, um, well, part of what we, our goal is, is to save taxpayers money. And, and we do that through this line of business, and we'll kind of show you how. So we do this through interagency trainings. So instead of sending 10 agencies to DC for the same training, maybe it's supervisor refresher training or such like that, we'll put on the training here, here locally. So that allows us to, uh, you know, usually we can get the presenters at a lower cost and there's no per diem, no travel costs that, that's engaged in that. So some of the interagency's trainings that we do, um, supervisory, uh, career development, soft skills, um, kind of surprised as far as how, how, how many people do want to do business writing class or, or you know, it's just simple Excel 
uh, classes or such like that. But again, you know, if that's what what uh, they need to to uh, strengthen their job, that's great. We do quite a few financial management awareness programs. OPM encourages every federal agency to touch base with their their employee at least three three times during their career. So to be aware of what benefits they have and how they can utilize those benefits at the end of their career. So, and again, you know, we um, uh, last year we had over 800 federal employees that we we uh, we trained on that. Uh, we have a, I think a early slash mid career coming up in June that we have over 500 folks already signed up for that. Um, so again, this opportunity for you to uh, to uh, be aware and again go to to our friends. Uh, here to, to kind of get, uh, get engaged in the, and plan for your, your future as well. Um, we also host a diversity education awareness committee. So DEI committees are real strong right now and that's a uh, initiative for the, for the uh, uh, Biden administration. We've had that since uh, 1999 uh, and again we celebrate each of the special emphasis months and then engage them within all the agencies. So we'll put on a, you know, that's the one nice thing about COVID and the Zoom, we're able to reach out to a lot more um, employees through that. Alternative, alternative Dispute Resolution or Shared Neutrals Program. Uh, we've also had that for over 20 years. Uh, it, with that, we have over 80 trained mediators. So say there is a work, workplace conflict, either between two employees or an employee and their manager they can reach out, they can call our hotline and we can arrange for a mediator to go out free of charge and to uh, try to negotiate to a solution to that. And they do a pretty good job. They have over a 70% success rate when, uh, when we go out and do, do the live, uh, live uh, medi mediations. The cost savings to the government is incredible through that because if, it's, if we don't resolve it and it goes to EEO complaint, that EEO complaint is right around $80,000. So when you get the lawyers involved, that the prices go a lot higher. So we're very, uh, you know, each year we're able to uh, uh, save the taxpayers close to $2 million just, just from that line of business. Um, and the response to re recruitment retention assistance, uh, we do a lot of work uh, with the local universities trying to encourage uh, people that are just coming out, uh, uh, young adults that are coming out of college to think about public service and going to that. So. Uh, some of the trainings we have, leadership trainings. Uh, we have the, uh, um, we had 40 hosted tra virtual trainings, uh, 50, uh, 50 other national trainings, executive women in motion, uh, executive training. We have our own interagency mentoring program, uh, as well as se several um, leadership development programs. Some other, other programs, we host our own Federal Emerging Leaders Development Program. We work with OPM on the, uh, lead, their leadership development program. Uh, actually, this came from the, uh, the General Staff Command College, the KU Advanced Leadership Training, which a lot of the, the participants from, from the General Staff Command College work with, with KU, so we designed a program with KU, to similar program for our, our uh, federal leaders. Uh, we have a, uh, we work closely with Army Management Staff College and have opportunities there. Uh, we were one of the first uh, to work with OPM for out in the region for the President's Management Council Interagency Rotation Program. That allows high potential 13s to 15s to uh, do a six month rotation at, at another agency. And, uh, and again, the continu continuation of the uh, Executive Women in Motion. Other trainings, I'm not going to go through all that, but you kind of see some of the trainings that, that we do as far as leadership training. Soft skills, business writing, we have a monthly webinar series, we do a facilitation training. So again, we have a facilitation cadre, instead of having someone, having an co outside contractor come in and facilitate a meeting, we have a group that will do it free of charge from, from some of our federal agencies. And as always, some of our more, more popular pre-retirement seminars. Uh, it's been a while, but we, we come up and host them here in, in the Fort Leavenworth area as well. Uh, we do a life after retirement, kind of a series that's, that has been live, so we hope to bring that back um, here in the next, uh, next couple of years. And then, of course, the, uh, the early career mid, 
early slash mid career life planning seminar, which is coming up, and we do that once a year in June. So, everyone has heard about the retirement wave. I, I would assume that 50% of the civilian federal employees are eligible to retire right now. Uh, you know, it's, it's scarier than that because right of the the current personnel, um, individuals under in the federal government, there's only 11% of our personnel that are under 30. So we got a lot of work to do, folks. So and, you know, so we work again closely with uh, outside organizations. I think we have, well, uh, let me go through here. Nope. We, we might have a slide on it. Um, we were also a, a pilot city for the Government to University uh, Initiative. And what that is, that's uh, with Volcker Institute, which is a think tank out of DC. They worked with us and the Mid-America Regional Council to engage local, local colleges and, and working with not only the federal government, but the local state governments to encourage public service within the, those universities. That has since expanded to five different era, uh, different cities, um, but the, again, we we're very lucky to be on the ground floor, trying to get out there in, in front of the colleges and in front of the uh, the uh, uh, professors. Let them know exactly what what opportunities are out there. And again, for those that you know, if you're going to do a you know service after you know um, civilian service after uh, your military days. Government is a great place because you know you you have really there's every job uh, from the earth to the moon within the government and you can always transition from one to another after you get in there. Uh, our diversity education cultural awareness uh, program. So this is one of those committees that kind of helps us out. We put on those monthly programs and then other diversity trainings. Uh, we do offer a public employees recognition week. So that was just the uh, first week of this this year. Uh, where we have we work with the uh, city and county of the uh, of, uh, of Kansas City uh, to recognize our public service employees dur during that time. ADR we, we we discussed that since we only have 77 mediators right now, but fr from 29 different agencies. And then here's some of our retention assistance uh, programs. Uh, we we have a human resources committee to, s to share share best practices, information sharing. There's a lot of uh, information that goes from DC or OMB out 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 there that we try to make sure that's uh, um, utilized, and then the uh, some of the public service outreach, intern enrichment programs, and, and so forth. So we really are, if you're familiar with the Chico Council in DC, we are the regional Chico Council. And again, thanks to you and as participation last year, our cost avoidance for the taxpayers was over $2 million. So, any questions on workforce development and support? Yes. So I run one of the five academic departments here in the Command and General Staff School. The neuroscience of leadership and new mediator training, um, is that something we could contact you for to have somebody come up? Absolutely. And it's, it's interesting, I retired from active duty in 2016, mm -hmm. and you have this notion that I, I spent 27 years in uniform, I, I've got the leadership thing down. Leading Army civilian professionals is still leadership, but it's different than leading uniform um, professionals. So I'd be really interested in, in having some folks come up and talk to us um, about that, some of those leadership training opportunities. The other one that caught my eye is new mediator training. We don't, we're not a, we don't really have that many workplace disputes, but just that mindset is something I think we could benefit from. You know, we actually <laughs> have a lot of the agency heads that actually uh, take that new mediator training because yeah. it is a great, it's a great skill to have. Yeah. I mean, not only at work, but also at home. Uh, so, <laughs> so you, you would be, that yeah, would it's, a, it's a great engagement, exactly. uh, I'd be more than happy to, okay. and that's, that's, that's why we're here. I mean, we yeah. want to be able to, to share with some of the best practices with you. And not only that, yeah, you're, you're right, it is different, leadership is different from the DOD to the civilians, yeah. but also now, I mean, it's a completely different leadership uh, style with the, uh, you know, generations. So I'm sure you do generation training. 
but now there's now there's a generation training and a remote yeah. management training that that's you have to engage in. So well, that, that's that's a great point because we have we have this notion that you know our students are you know ninety nine percent are uniform military, right. but they're not our generation, and they see things differently. They have access to a much broader array of information than we ever had with a velocity that we couldn't imagine back when I was a senior captain, junior major. Mm -hmm. So that's that's all compelling stuff, and I'll, I'll come talk to you. Absolutely. Afterwards. Thank you. Love that. Captain. Any captain other Michael, questions? Yes, sir. Get that resolution. Yeah. In that uh, retirement wave, I think I heard you say 50% <laughs> of our government workforce is eligible for yeah. retirement. Within the next that's, five years, correct. That's astounding. Yeah. Uh, so right. two questions based on that. <laughs> Number one, is our government getting any better at providing you the resources to properly educate and train your workforce in all these issues related to retirement, PSP, Medicare, income tax planning, required minimum, all this stuff, the laws changed with the SECURE yeah. Act. Are you getting, or is your workforce getting coached in these things? Well, then you know this is being recorded, so I mean, what do you expect me to say? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> actually, actually, yes. Uh, TSP has been fantastic over the last, last especially three years. They have uh, they they've set up monthly trainings in all different areas as far as where you need to be in your career for your TSP dollars. OPM is doing a better job uh, educating within FERS and SERS. Uh, they engage with. Um, um, well, it uh, used to be John Hancock, I can't remember what it was, that does, does the long-term um, uh, long insurance program. They're, they've engaged with them to actually not only provide that, that insurance program, but also kind of be the lead for the, uh, the benefits, health benefits program as well. So uh, that is, uh, that's something again, you know, you know, we do organize some health fairs. Uh, when we do the retirement things, we, uh, that's one of the, you know, people are always interested. You know, how do I? You know, what what is my health health uh, uh, benefits when when I retire? Which one should I go with? We can't answer that. I mean, we could spend two days with all the different entities to do that. Again, because of COVID, though, we're able to engage more of the um, insurance companies and have webinars where you know we'll we'll get Blue Cross Blue Shield and Geico and uh, uh, Avanta together and they'll, they'll do a presentation and they've done a good job of working together as far as here's what we offer. You know, you know, if you're looking for that, maybe you go with MetLife or such like that. So I would say yes, they've gotten better. Can they always, can they get even more better? Absolutely. Um, I think there's are, there are some areas of the country to do a great job. I know when we started doing more of the virtual, I mean, just yesterday we were contacted with folks in rural Missouri and in Iowa or such like that and saying, hey, where can we get this information? I mean, I'm glad you're able to allow that. Because even though it's kind of, it's like everything, uh, it's, you know, here in Kansas City, even though we're a regional hub, oh, the people in D.C. don't understand this. And, but when you're in Des Moines and you look at the, you know, you're out there in the field office, those people in Kansas City don't understand us. So it, it's, it, it's still like that. Uh, we do need to do a better job of uh, of reaching out regionally to uh, to help those people understand, and it'd be great to have partnerships with a an organization that could help us. With I'm glad that. to hear there's a lot more access than there yep. used to be. Yeah. The second part of the question: How are we doing on recruiting young people to join the government workforce? Is it easy, hard? Where are we at on that? Uh, it is difficult. So. Um, it has changed, I mean, benefits-wise, it's, it's difficult, well, first of all, to get in front, front of, the, of young people to understand. It's difficult for them to understand, hey, I just paid $120,000 in, in uh, tuition over this past four years, and you're gonna offer me a $30,000 job. Um, and when on the private side, they can, they can get more. They don't factor in the, uh, the benefits that we offer, obviously, the health benefits are incredible with the government, uh, but some corporations are catching up to us. Uh, they're, they're understanding that. We now have maternity leave, which you know was a, a, a big coup where we have 12 weeks of maternity leave that, that we don't, didn't have before, uh, which is fantastic. Um, 
you know, we are looking at tuition reimbursement, uh, but again, that's not know. uniform as well. So that I think that's one of the big things. And we also need to get back to the point where being with the government of school. I mean, you, you go back, and I'll, you have to go a, a ways back, I mean, with the Kennedy administration, they had all kinds of people. They were able to set up the Peace Corps. They were able to, you know, they wanted to work for the, go the government. And there are, there are individuals out there that they, they want to be of service, and they may be working for a nonprofit, or they, you know, they're not sure what they want to do. We need to do a better job as, of helping them understand how cool it is. And then going back to saying, you know, maybe you try, you go in the government as an accountant. I don't like being an accountant. That's all right. We've got a, you know, ten thousand other jobs that you can you can apply for. So, and again, it's it, you can you don't have to. And I think when you look at the population now, the generations coming out, they're not looking for a long career. And so, when you go recruiting, you say, hey, you can you can take this job and retire with the government. Hey, that's not an incentive for them. They think they're going to get bored. You're not going to get bored because, you know, maybe you don't like this position, but you've got any other position you want out there. And then all those benefits carry over. Yep. Yeah, I, I was going to say, we, we're seeing it here in, in the school. So we're, we started having civilian faculty in the 2002. So a raft of those folks are becoming second retirement eligible. They're all guard lieutenants, colonels, or colonels and so forth. And uh, that's caused um, a big spike in our hiring. I'm, I'm working to hire seven Title X faculty just in the resident program and four in the satellite, for instance. In recruiting, um, three years ago when I started in the department as a deputy, never gave much thought to recruiting. I spend a tremendous amount of time recruiting potential faculty now more so than I ever did two years ago. Um, the four folks that have applied for the two satellite positions we have at Fort Belvoir, for instance, I've already talked to two of them for over an hour apiece before they applied, uh, before the job announcement opened. And I tell them, hey, I can talk to you right up until CPAC launches the announcement that I can't give you any special consideration until. But I think educating senior managers in the government side on how to actually recruit, and recruiting is more than confirming the PD and the job announcement with CPAC <coughs> and hitting send and waiting for the resumes to come out of the system. So we've gotten much more sophisticated in the college in that because we have to. The competitions, I mean, if you if you think of all the, the agencies that hire Department of the Army civilians here on post, Army Management Staff College has grown huge. So we're trying to hire Title Tens, they're hiring GS-13s. There's a perception difference, for instance. So knowing, knowing the the employment trends of your own population and knowing that you can't just be a passive participant. Um, I think one of the things we could do to help ourselves is our, our hiring practices and velocity is archaic in today's environment. And uh, it takes a long time to work a federal hiring action. And then for us, if we hire faculty that are coming straight off active duty, it takes an inordinate amount of time to do a 180 day waiver, for instance. You can't start federal employment until six months after you retire. Right. For, and it's, we preach agile and adaptive, but the system does not necessarily believe that. So there's things we could be doing. Um, it's just gonna take some policy changes and some attitude changes on senior managers and, and policy makers to help us do that recruiting. Right. So. And and they are looking, and going back to, had there been improvements? Yeah. Uh, believe it or not, USA Jobs has vastly improved over the yes. last five years. Yeah. Uh, uh, you, know, you still look at it and wonder, wow, how can they <laughs> go through it? But, but it's got, it has gotten better. Uh, you know, the OPM uh, benefits payouts, I mean, they, they were 12 months out, and now they're, they're down to less than six. So they're, they're getting better, and largely because they are automating more stuff which is great. The other thing that we, we have found, uh, again, I think with, uh, you know, you, you look at the blessings and you look at what COVID did, it allowed us to put some procedures in there that we could do hiring within 30 days. And may, learning some, some of those best practices, what works and what didn't work, hopefully will, will help the entire uh, recruiting uh, uh, program in the future.
relatively, how should I say this, getting a relatively senior workforce comfortable with some of the digital tools we had to jump right into when we, <laughs> on the 16th of March, we were, we were notified that no one's coming back of sure. 2020. And uh, some folks adapted to the digital tools quicker than others did. Mm -hmm. And we had, a, we had a hit team down in the department that went from employee to employee, picking off the, the issues they had in connectivity and, and, and configuration and things like that. But that's something we did proactively because we were getting the sense that, oh, we've never done this before. Right, I've never had COVID before, <laughs> and we do, so, but that's interesting. Yeah, very good, thank you for those questions. <coughs> Any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, well, I'm an instructor here. <coughs> My question is, understanding the wave and this projection of a lot of people leaving in the near future, do you have a sense of what, like the percentage of fill, like across the federal agencies, like are you, at a certain um, percentage th uh, of your authorized amount, amount of people? Like what, what does that look like in general? Do you have a sense of that now, going into the wave, if you will, but how do you look now? Well, a couple different, well, so immediately, we, we again, we, we said 50% within the next five years, they know, they believe that it's going to be like 10 percent each coming year and i think i'm getting you know getting the question you know, if i'm answering the question correctly one of the things that's now that's uh, we had a lot of folks that left because of covid because likewise we can't do this we just can't you know we're not comfortable doing that we now have a lot of folks that are that are now what do you mean we have to go back in the office so we have that and then we have a uh, economy that their TSPs have gone down a little bit. So now they're thinking, well, maybe I can, I can stay on. So it, it's, it's, it's totally revolving a, a little bit because we don't know. And we, you know again, we had, uh, and it ended up only being like 3% of the population that's, you know, when we, we were, um, when we had to be vaccinated, only 3% of the federal population that did not, did not get vaccinated and I don't know the numbers as far as who was exempt out of three percent and actually how many were let go I know they heavily looked into that in the the fall because you know there were some corporations that lost that tried that and lost 10 percent of their their folks um, I know we we're, were much more fortunate than the the private side so I think it's still about 10 percent each year um, and we are we're backfilling, but I think we're also backfilling only eight, eight to nine percent. And part of that is, you know, is probably good because, it, you know, automation has, has uh, automation, the AI and such has made it easier for the jobs to be done. However, I mean, it's, you know, will we catch up? And if we do have this, you know, everyone says, you yeah, know, that's, that's it, you know, where will we be? I know that's again going back to the, the hiring authorizations. They they've looked at those areas because it's when you delve down into it, like uh, um, IT, three percent of uh, our IT folks are under thirty. So we said you know said eleven percent of the population, three percent are uh, are under thirty. So. Uh, following up to, to the to Mark's question is at what just. Man, at a very high level, at what percentage of fill of all positions in you know, across the federal government are filled? You're at 75 percent, 80 percent, 100 percent. I hate to say it, but it's above my pay grade. I just, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure. I really, I don't. Well, you know. or they're here in yeah, Kansas yeah. City then. Oh yeah, I, I would say no. I mean, uh, as far as you know, I don't hear. Um, Recently, I know there's there's more job opportunities have been open. Mm -hmm. So you know we do collect vacancies, large vacancies for the agencies to distribute among. So I know Social Security is hiring. Uh, USCIS is used to be a big portion of us. We talked about the National Benefits Center or such like that. They've kind of they're kind of stagnant right now, uh, but they were they had a constant t turnover about 10 percent of folks. I'm just trying in. to make a yeah. comparison to your organizations compared to civilian corporations or organizations and, and the, 
the employment gap yeah. that we've got. So I would imagine it's probably it's, on yeah. average. Yeah, it's not nearly as bad as the, you know, the, um, I think private industry has as far as people not wanting to, wanting to work or not wanting to come back. about how, uh, how long it takes to hire someone. When I was in the operational force, in different positions, I, was, I would hire the de Department of the Army Civilian. And inevitably, it would take multiple months to sort through all the resumes. Sure. Then you'd interview some, you'd have your board, and then it would take a couple more months to you know, do all that piece. Then you'd talk to one person, and they moved on to something else, and yep. then the second, and they, you know, so six months later, I, I mean, I experienced sure. this multiple times. Six months later, you still don't have anyone coming in, so it's very cumbersome. Be that as it may, do you have, like, an average, like, how long does it take to onboard someone, to hire someone into these federal agencies? Is there a, a ballpark as to how long it takes? It depends upon the agency and depends upon the position in the agency. So um, six n months is not unheard of. I, I would, if I had to guess, I would say 90 days mm -hmm. is what I'm hearing. Again, I'm, you know, I'm not a hiring official or, or such like that, but that's what I'm, I'm hearing it usually takes about that, that time. But I mean, it, but again, when you look at a, a, a younger person straight out of college, that's eternity, 90 days. So uh, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of, lot of work we need to do. And I'm glad we're having this recorded because so, I will <laughs> share this with the, the folks at, in OPM and say, you know, here's what you hear. I mean, this is what, what, what we're hearing out in the field. So, and, th and they know it. Uh, like I said, I mean, OMB's in, in engaged in it. OPM knows that they're, they're working through it. Um, but yeah, I think going back to this, what someone said, it, there has to be some policy changes. That, for, for bringing somebody on board inside 180 days. The Department of Defense instruction authorizes delegating uh, authority to make that decision for below GS-14, which all of our faculty are, down as operationally efficient. Um, however, the Assistant Secretary of Army for Manpower and Reserve Affairs that runs a civilian policy delegation matrix has retained that at the MACOM Deputy Commanding General level. So regardless of what DOD says we can do, Army has held that one level up, and that's partly what slows it down. But I have a friend that's a, he's a, Joe and I retired around the same time, he's a GS-15 at Army Material Command, for instance. And their 180-day waivers generally get signed in a week or two because one of the SES deputy commanders down there has been given that mission. And unless they find an egregious violation of merit systems principles, yep, looks good, they've, they've followed merit systems principles. For whatever reason here, we have to go through Army U to the CAC Commanding General, to the GCG <coughs> and trade options, <coughs> and all the staffs in between. So it takes, it took me three and a half months to get an answer back on a 180 waiver packet. Not, that was after the hiring yeah, packet. Yeah. Well, <laughs> and they, you know, they, these retiring lieutenants, colonel and colonels, they can live okay off their pension, but not sure. exclusively. So. Yeah. Well, obviously, this is this is something we could talk about all, all day long, but I've got ten minutes left, so I, I will I'll talk to you after after class. Uh, so real quick, just to make sure we uh, go through everything, our last line is the strategic partnerships, and again, that's where we again any any program philanthropic or uh, initiative to uh, uh, to make the federal government better within the community we uh, go through. Uh, Heartland Combined Federal Campaign, again, that's a, across the board, so we're, we're engaged in that. We're, we sit on the board and organize uh, that, that each year. Uh, volunteer opportunities, we have a day of caring, which we, uh, is a one-day uh, volunteer activity that we, we coordinate. So lo lots of di different philanthropic things you kind of see under volunteer uh, opportunities. Toys for Tots, we, we uh, help uh, communicate that, harvesters, food drives, fed feeds families, school supply drives. Uh, so we, we engage with all the agencies on that. Again, we can't do that all by ourselves, so we ha do have several committees, a regional wellness council, again, looking at, uh, uh, you know, again, a healthy employee is a happy employee, so what can we do to make sure we do have uh, healthy employees and uh, ready, to, ready to work uh, when the time comes. Uh, we have a small business networking uh, committee. So again, 
we teach uh, uh, companies how to purchase and, uh, and uh, work with the government. So that engages not only the Small Business Administration, but the General Services Administration. And then we have a Veterans Affairs Committee that we, uh, again, work with the uh, veteran support groups and um, our veterans within our, our own agencies to learn what the benefits are and then, then find out what we need to, need to do next. Uh, other strategic partnerships, again, Greater Kansas City Chamber of Commerce, we have a, a person, usually it's the, our FEB chair, will sit on that. Mid-America Regional Council, we work uh, closely with them. They actually engage with uh, over 50 communities right around the metropolitan area. So we work, work real close with them. Regional Development Council, uh, we, were, we were part of the group. Uh, we had a, a couple new USDA agencies that moved from, relocated from DC to, to Kansas City. So we were part of that, that group, not to, we could just let them know that, hey, if you come to Kansas City, you have this organization in place and this is what we'll do. So it's not like you're going to be on your own. You're gonna actually co come to a new family. Um, U University of Kansas City, another um, Simon, uh, Simon Center. So I mean, uh, uh, and the, of course the uh, Census Bureau when the, the uh, census time's up and then the congressional offices as well. A lot of what we talked about, and you can find a lot at our, our website, and that's uh, kansascity.feb.gov. Uh, so you can find out what's going on, the events that are coming up, uh, our operating status for the, for the for the current year, as well as some uh, some perks and discounts that are, are available. Uh, if you want to know more about if you're trying or if you relocate to another part of the country and you're trying to find the FEB in that area, you can go to just feb.gov, and that will t that will list all the locations of FEBs and what the, their coverage areas are. And obviously, uh, you can reach out to us at any time. I work for you. So I mean I'm you know I I exist only to make your life a little bit better. So if I can assist you in some way um, to to increase the mission of your of your agency or to, to uh, get you be that 411 department to to connect you with another another agency, uh, please reach out to me. So there's our general general uh, uh, email and website, and my my email is larry.heisel at gsa.gov. So technically I'm an OPM employee, but I'm, uh, I'm um, housed by GSA within their regional offices. I think, of course, thank you. And I'll take any other questions, time permitting. Any questions on strategic partnerships? Yes, sir. Uh, I, I can talk to you offline about the okay. other things. I'm fine. So the other aspect of it, you're too deep and you rely upon volunteers if I remember correctly yep. or heard correctly. Mm -hmm. So which agencies do the volunteers come from and then when they volunteer what, kind, what status do they have to be in and what kind of support are they allowed to provide? Yep. Um, so they, I would say roughly 50% of the agencies have at least somebody on, on one of the committees. So each o October after the start of the fiscal year We'll send an email out to every agency heads and with who we have listed as far as on the different committees. Um, so that way we know that they have permission. They, they go through it and they either add or delete, but we know if they're, engaged, they're, if they're coming to meetings or such that they've gotten the approval to be part of this committee. Um, the involvement varies. Uh, a lot of it is just information sharing uh, often, like we we take like the H A H R committee, um, you know, we get the emails from O P M or the Chico Council, and a lot of times we get it out to our local H R folks before their headquarters does. It's just that's just the way it is. I mean, they you know, so we kind of help skip some steps. Uh, a lot of the committees, like the diversity committee and the and the veterans committee, w they are on there as representatives of their agency, and usually we try to have meetings like the diversity committee early in the month, so say it's Black History Month, uh, we'll put on a presentation and we'll offer them resources. Um, again, with COVID, we were able to broadcast it to you know the, the entire agencies instead of just our groups, but then we encourage them to go back and put on a different program for their agencies at their, their own workplace. Same thing with the veterans. 
Uh, not a lot of time commitment. It depends upon what's, what they're, they're engaged in. I mean, most of the time commitment is going to be an hour a month or if they're working on, say, they're going to be in charge of, going back to diversity, if they're going to be in charge of uh, Asian Pacific Islanders month, then maybe they'll have a few more hours. So it's not real, real hard. The HR committee is really nothing. I mean, you, you, know, you, get, you get the information, you distribute it to whoever needs it uh, within your own organization. Did I answer that, that question? Okay. And so you also had a slide that listed, like military, I think it was 1,500 plus. Mm -hmm. And are, is the representation proportional based upon the size? Okay, one more time. So um, you had a slide that showed the breakdown of the, of the members in your region, and I think the military was 1,500. So my question is, is are your volunteer, oh. volunteer support no. proportional to? No. <laughs> uh, n it's not. And that's, that's okay. Um, no, and largely, I mean, we do get more support from, from the civilian sector than we do DOD or, or uh, postal, I guess. I mean, that's, uh, and, and a lot of it's because, you know, the, unless it's the civilian side, I mean, there's different pay grades and such like that. So, uh, but that's okay. I mean, we would like to have more involvement with s some of our posts and some of our military, uh, you know, it's, Interested, Corps of Engineers, very engaged. Um, Leavenworth has half a dozen people that are on different committees, and that's, and that's great. I mean, they're they're representative, but yeah, it's it's not that we, and there are some that we don't want. Like for the diversity committee, we don't want more than six people from one agency to be on be on the diversity committee because we don't want one agency to, you know take over the complete presence of that, that committee. So uh, so we're always looking for more volunteers. We actively recruit them in October, but we'll take them anytime. Okay. Time for one more question, if you have it. Okay. I think I'm going back to that slide. Yeah. So DOD, yep. that, yeah. So that doesn't include uh, white men as well as, you know, Fort Leavenworth. Which board, uh, since there's time, which board covers uh, Fort Riley? There's not a board. Now, uh, so we cover, and we've not alla been allowed to expand past our traditional things that were set up in, in uh, well, our, our board was established in 63, but we're supposed to cover areas we can reach out, so we reach out and we email Wichita and Omaha and such like that. Now, with CFC, we do cover that. So we also know with the, the, the Bio Ag Center that someone's gonna have to be out there. So the new, and I wish I could tell you more, but I just don't know more, but again, with the new uh, formula they're going to do with FEDs, they're, they're talking about, you know, they want all of the country covered by one FED, so I could see us, since we are already a regional hub, kind of be that source for the, the uh, uh, four state area with the assistance from, from St. Louis as well. On behalf of the Foundation yep. and Simon Center, thank you for an engaging Thank you, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, appreciate it. And I'll hang around for any questions. All right, and as we close, um, wrap up this year's brown bag i want to thank everybody once again for participating thanks again to our sponsors for this year first command and i also want to mention major taylor and his av specialists uh, we very much appreciate the support we received with the, from through our partnership with the college um, your professionalism is much appreciated as well i also want to do a special shout out to mr greg sanders the chief of operations at cgss who's actually worked with me on a day-to-day -day basis to be able to bring you this presentation so once again, we look forward to seeing you again as we start up the brown bag presentations again in the fall. Um, I'll remind you that all the broadcasts from this year as well as previous years are available at both our uh, Foundation and Simon Center websites as well as on our YouTube channel. Once again, thank you all very much, and we'll see you again in the fall.